All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the State of the World 2013 Press Breakfast. My name is Supriya Kumar, and I'm the Communications Manager here at World Watch. Um, in this 30th edition of State of the World, we pose the question, is sustainability still possible? And here today, we have a few panelists who are going to discuss some of the main points of the report. We have Robert Engelman, who is the president of World Watch, um, Eric Asadorian and Tom Pru, who are the co-directors of this edition of State of the World. We also have Jenny Moore and Kim Stanley Robinson, who are both contributing authors. Jenny Moore is the director of sustainable development and environmental stewardship at the British Columbia Institute of Technology. And Kim Stanley Robinson is an acclaimed science fiction author who's also, they're both contributing authors to the report. As most of you know, we're actually doing the official launch later this afternoon in the same very space. So we hope that some of you or most of you will stay or come back for it. Um, and lastly, if you have any questions, would like any review copies for the book, or would like to speak to any of the authors, either here today or later on, please come and speak with me. I'll be around here, so if you have any questions at all. With that, I'll turn to Rob. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, can you all hear me? Is this slide over at all, or maybe not? I think probably I can be heard. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, Particularly this morning, on a, on a morning when the news is all about senseless, stupid tragedy, it's, it's um, all the harder to focus on the constructive things that uh, people are trying to accomplish in the world, but I, I would argue all the more important. So um, we're, we're talking about an issue with, if anything, renewed vigor and importance uh, given the events of yesterday in Boston. Um, as journalists, you pride yourselves on using words accurately, and at the World Watch Institute, uh, we like to believe our standards are just as high. Uh, for years, we've been watching with um, initially amusement and, um, and then concern and eventually dismay um, at the, the abuse of the words sustainable, uh, sustainable development and sustainability. Um, the, the recent profusion of what we have taken to calling sustainable, uh, sustainable products, sustainable businesses, sustainable cities, sustainable design and cars and clothing and seafood and just about everything was the starting place for the theme of this year's edition of State of the World 2013. As Supriya said, is sustainability still possible? Now, World Watch's mission for the past four years has been to use research, stories, analysis, and outreach to speed the shift to a truly sustainable society that meets human needs. So we at World Watch have to care about this term and how it's used and what it means. And we've always tried, at least, to uphold the standard of the definition that was originally propagated, um, although I like to claim World Watch used the term uh, even before this, but it was originally propagated by the World Commission on Sustainable Development, the Rue Harlem Brundtland Commission, um, uh, in its report, Our Common Future, in 1987, that to be sustainable means whatever you're doing won't undermine the capacity of future generations to have uh, just as good a life as you do. Um, I was just thinking this morning to, uh, um, maybe this is kind of bad, but it's, uh, was it, um, who wrote the, I don't remember the, the name of the book in which the guy said, love means never having to say you're sorry. What was Eric that book? Siegel. Eric Siegel. That's Good what I'm thinking course. of, yeah. Sustainability it means never having to say that you're sorry to the future. <laughs> that just occurred to me, sorry. Um, one of my favorite examples um, of sustainable uh, is, was the city of London's, or the metropolis of London's uh, desire to have the, the first sustainable Olympics last year in their Olympic Games. And it occurs to us that, um, that for generations in ancient Greece, the Olympics were totally sustainable. There was no question about sustainability then. And really, for probably generations in the 19th century when the Olympics began, uh, there were far less, less resources being used that had far less of an impact on the environment than uh, last year's did with all the people and all the attention and all the energy and resources they expended. Along the same lines, I was amused to be spewing carbon dioxide over the North Atlantic Ocean not too long ago, along with a couple hundred uh, fellow air passengers, and I'll be the first to admit that I myself am not remotely, truly sustainable. And I was reading on the packaging that came with my uh, cardboard-like uh, airline dinner, um, telling me that the food packaging came from sustainable sources, whatever they could be. 
My introductory chapter to the book called Beyond Sustainable argues that this is not just a, a frivolous uh, tactic for greenwashing. Um, it's not just a distraction. It's really a dangerous phenomenon that um, saps the sense of urgency we need to address what is basically a, an existential crisis for civilization. And like the book itself, the chapter addresses the question, what is true sustainability? How do we define it? How do we measure it? How do we figure out how far short of it we are? Um, and then how do we actually work to approach it? Because that's what we're going to need to do. And critically, if we don't get to true sustainability anytime soon, what then? The essence of the concept of sustainability is concerned for the future. Actually giving voice to the future, which is something you don't see much in evidence today in a place like Washington, D.C., or for that matter, many other world capitals. Yet there is a strong, a long tradition um, of government, uh, in government, of at least paying some lip service to the needs and the importance of future generations. In the United States, this goes back at least to the administration of Theodore Roosevelt um, and the origins of the conservation movement uh, at the beginning of the 20th century and Roosevelt's very first address to the U.S. Uh, Congress. He talked about uh, the sense of responsibility he had uh, to think about the America's resources as being something that future generations would be able to enjoy just as much as the ones that were, were uh, listening to him back then. In 1969, the U.S. National Environmental Policy Act affirmed the interest uh, of future generations in the U.S. government's handling of the environment of the United States. And just this past January, President Obama suggested that failure to address climate change would, quote, betray future generations. But the truth is we don't approach uh, uh, very rigorously climate change or any other environmental problem this way, thinking about the future. At the moment, it's safe to say that no government is taking actions that are commensurate with the risk of catastrophic environmental change. The overwhelming interest, and it's somewhat understandable, but still a problem, is in getting back on track with the basic pattern of economic growth that when combined with population growth, is putting us in the unsustainable predicament in which we find ourselves today. Probably the best illustration of this dangerous trajectory is the current rapid increase in greenhouse gas emissions. Scientists at the World Bank and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, according to a news report that came out just yesterday, uh, project that we're on a path that could, in fact, lead to a planetary warming that in the World, World Bank reports words that civilization may simply not be able to adapt to a pretty sobering thought. And at this point, nonetheless, there's really no serious or politically feasible proposal for changing that emissions trajectory. In my chapter and in this book, we at World Watch are suggesting that there is a way, uh, an approach to our predicament, uh, that even while alleviating poverty and considering the justifiable needs of all human beings for a decent life, um, that strategy mostly mirrors the structure of this book. And it goes in simplified fashion like this. Expose sustainable, any false uses of the term, and instead insist on rigorous definitions of sustainability. Insist that the concept means that you are not undermining the future with your current behavior. And that's measurable. And aim to measure true sustainability and use that metric to judge where we are today, what progress we are making, or how far we are retreating from real sustainability. Use these metrics, once we have them, to propose policies that will move society toward true sustainability. Many of these ideas and many of the things we'll need to be doing are obviously scarcely politically feasible today, uh, but the environment and climate are deteriorating rapidly, and social and political change can occur even more rapidly. If you want a current example of that, just look at public views and political shifts on same-sex marriage. Build a democratic movement that honestly and with full integrity moves us toward full sustainability. Work to transform the culture of high consumption, something that Eric will be talking about. And just as much, I think, the notion that population growth is so good for the world that women's health and women's freedom to make decisions about their own childbearing should be subordinated. Uh, to keep population growth going. Accept that no human being has any greater claim or right to the world's atmospheric space or other global natural resources than any other. 
consider the likelihood that economic growth, or at least the constant growth in the consumption of energy and natural resources, will no longer be possible for all countries. It should be prioritized for those that are least developed. Finally, prepare for the shortfall, the likelihood that we will not get all the way to sustainability soon enough to fully ward off radical and possibly disastrous global environmental and climate change. So this book proceeds on this basic structure, and it looks at the realities and possibilities in all these areas. I'm not going to tell you the answer to the question that we ask in the book subtitle, uh, but I will say that, in my own view, it matters uh, less what the answer to the question is than our own willingness to simply buckle down and get to work on a, as dramatic a turnaround and as fast a turnaround in the direction we're headed as we can manage. And to say more about the first important step in this process, defining and measuring where we stand relative to sustainability, I'm going to turn this microphone over to State of the World Chapter author Jenny Moore. Thanks. Jenny. Thank you, Bob. So good morning. The first section of the book deals with uh, sustainability metrics, comprising three chapters. The first by Carl Folk, who talks about biodiversity and um, the boundaries that we would need to live within in order to stay within ecological caring capacity. So these planetary boundaries comprise nine general topic areas, climate change, biodiversity loss, the nitrogen cycle, which is tied to the phosphorus cycle, ozone depletion, ozone acidification, freshwater use, changing land use, aerosol loadings, and chemical pollution, the persistent organic compounds that stay in our environment. Um, the chapter reveals a what I find frightening uh, reality that we've probably already passed the threshold in three of those areas, climate change, biodiversity loss, and the nitrogen cycle. So in terms of getting to sustainability, I think right now it's not looking so good from, the, from that perspective. And the chapter does articulate what the safe thresholds might be. So that's our planetary boundary space. The next chapter is presented by Kate Raworth who talks about safe and just spaces. So just as there's planetary or ecological boundaries, there's also some social justice boundaries that we would have to live within. And if those two come together, she creates a vision of a donut. We can live not below the social thresholds and not above the planetary boundaries, but within that space, then, then that would be the place that we need to optimize for. And her metrics deal with food, water, income, education, resilience, voice and decision making in public uh, political discussions, jobs, energy, social equity, gender equity, health. So these are the major issues and, and you can start to see the relationships where things tie together, land use, climate change and agriculture, food for example. These things are polemic and tied together. So uh, she says, uh, she makes a very important point which is that right now we're using GDP as the only metric to gauge our pro progress in development, social advancement. And that's like trying to fly a plane with only an altimeter. It can tell you how high you are relative to the ground, but it's, it doesn't provide the compass in terms of what direction are you heading. It doesn't uh, give you the fuel gauge, how much resources do you have left in order to get to your, your destination. So these things are missing from the GDP, and that's why the argument is being made that we need other different metrics, and perhaps the planetary boundaries um, the uh, social safe spaces are things that we can look at. My own chapter looks at getting to one planet living. It uses the ecological footprint as the metric. That is a, an index, if you will, that compares our total demand on nature services with the available supply that could be managed continuously year after year after year. We use the city of Vancouver, my own hometown, and co-author William Reese's hometown of Vancouver, as a, a case study, and, and there again, unfortunately, the news isn't so great. Vancouver, for all of its sustainability attributes, is still far in excess of what would be required to live in one plant with one planet. We're about 66% over that threshold. So we are talking a significant reduction of uh, energy and materials consumption throughput by the average Vancouverite if we wanted to get to sustainability. We're looking at issues of food, transportation, buildings, consumable goods, and water. But what we haven't included in that study is government services, public services that are managed at a national level. And if those were included, we would have an even farther 
reduction, probably at the level of factor four, 75% reduction. So it's, it's, a, it's a big change that we're looking at, 75, 66 to 75% reductions. So I don't want to be a doomsayer, but I think we have been sustained battling for at least 30 years, and it is time to get serious about sustainability. And with that, I will turn it over to Eric Asadurian. Great. Thank you, Jenny. I do want to add that the first section also, those are three chapters that kind of really capture some of the sustainability metrics, but it's also supplemented with looks at freshwater, fisheries, energy, uh, and minerals as well. Uh, and even once we have a good understanding of what sustainability is and how far off we are, admittedly, uh, getting to a, a truly sustainable society, it's not going to be easy. We're going to ha have to act boldly and quickly to get there. Uh, and the second section of the report really goes into a lot of good ideas for bold actions to get us there. And uh, in the 14 chapters, I want to draw attention to uh, four themes that I thought uh, kind of ran through all the, the, the sections. Uh, first, uh, as I write about specifically in the opening chapter of the report, we'll need to re-engineer cultures so that living sustainably feels as natural as living as a consumer feels today. Uh, over the last century or even two centuries, consumerism has been engineered into our cultural systems. Uh, and that has made it feel so natural to live these high income, high consumption lifestyles. Uh, and that was a, a strategic uh, kind of path that was uh, supported by a lot of institutions, business, government, marketing. Uh, and if we actually study those, that process and learn from these institutions, we can re-engineer cultures using those same institutions. And, and the good news is that cultural pioneers around the world are starting to use the arts, marketing, media, government, uh, religion and traditions, uh, education to sow the seeds of a culture of sustainability. Second, along with transforming cultures, we'll have to re-ground our economies in the ecological realities of the planet. As Robert Costanza and his co-authors discuss in Chapter 11, uh, this will require uh, changing away from GDP, as, as Jenny also mentions, internalizing externalities, uh, constricting the power of the financial sector, which Gus Beth writes about in a box in that chapter, and helping corporations become more responsible, a topic that Chapters 12 and 13 also delve into. The third theme is uh, changing society's energy infrastructure from one based on fossil fuels to one based on renewable energy. Now that's not a new theme, certainly, but what is new, and I'm, I was very excited to, to include this chapter this year, is chapter 14, is this idea of intentionally keeping oil, coal, and gas in the ground, recognizing their, their dangerous potential and curbing their, their tapping in the first place. And that's not to say that no fossil fuels should be used. They're going to be necessary in building the transition to a renewable energy economy. Building solar panels and wind turbines is very energy intensive and will need fossil fuels. But the key, as Chapter 15 uh, explores, uh, physicist Tom Murphy, specifically the author of Chapter 15, is that we have to start this transition now. Otherwise, we may fall into an energy trap where we don't have enough energy both to make this transition to a renewable economy and supply the energy needs of society. Now, any one of these three transformations will be uh, daunting, and pursuing all three simultaneously may seem near impossible. Uh, but making them will require mobilizing citizens to demand sweeping political change, as the closing two chapters of the section point out. Annie Leonard, the uh, head of Story of Stuff, if you are familiar with that, uh, explains in, in the final chapter that gone are the days of thinking that we can, can consume our way to a sustainable culture or society. Uh, the power of the individual does not lie in his wallet, but in his willingness to act politically, boldly, to demand a just and sustainable future. Now, I admit that we have not done any of these things <laughs> to the level that we need to since the environmental movement brought them to our attention in the past 50 years. And there is little to suggest that now, especially with Earth's systems starting to unravel, 
and societies increasingly shifting to dealing with these changes, it, it seems like the odds are pretty low that suddenly we'll have an aha moment and make these shifts. Uh, so this year, for the first time ever, we at World Watch added a special section to State of the World to help us pre to prepare for that eventuality. Tom? <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Um, I'm the bringer of the bad news, I guess. Yeah. The third section is called Open in Case of Emergency. <clears throat> and you might ask yourself, what is the emergency? Well, last November, the accounting firm Price Waterhouse Coopers, a pretty mainstream outfit not known for alarmism, released a report saying that it was too late to hold future increases in global average temperatures to only two degrees Celsius. The, the report actually said it's time to prepare for a warmer world. The same month, also in November, the World Bank, another fairly mainstream conservative organization, released its own report entitled Turn Down the Heat, which told us why we simply have to avoid a four degree warmer world. And if that weren't enough, if you, even if you weren't looking for other evidence of environmental compromise or degradation, the news was full of it. Um, stories about the failure of the Rio plus 20 talks, about zombie coral reefs, about the shrinking Arctic sea ice, and just many other things going wrong with the planet's natural systems. The other part of the emergency is that we're still mostly in denial of these problems. And while it's still possible that uh, we might step onto the path of true sustainability, it's certainly no longer a fringe position to argue that trouble is on the way. And if that's the case, then we ought to be making some, some preparations. And that's why the third section of the report, Open in Case of Emergency, has tapped uh, some notable thinkers who write and ponder about what we might do instead of just stockpiling guns and canned goods to, to make the best of what's, what's lying ahead. Um, and Jenny also almost stole a joke I was going to make about uh, the altimeter. Uh, but this is a little different. It says if, uh, if you jump out of the airplane that she was talking about, it's nice to have an altimeter, but it's better to have a parachute. Uh, the parachute being uh, something in the nature of resilience. And that's what one of the key themes of these authors in uh, the third section of the book is, which is build resilience, which is the ability of a social or ecological system to absorb a shock and keep functioning. And several authors touch on this. Eric um, has. Uh, and he, he argues in his second chapter in the book, Eric was really busy this year writing two chapters and doing a bunch of other things. He argues in his second chapter that we need to begin by building an enduring environmental movement that really grounds our ethics and behavior in ecological reality. Currently, they certainly are not. Michael Maniates believes that resilience would be improved if environmental education, especially at the college level, stopped misleading students into thinking that the coming crises will trigger or, or galvanize the right kind of action. Because what they're more likely to do, in fact, is to generate conflict, which won't help us get where we need to be at all. Uh, another author, Paula Green, stresses the value of community roots and strong social capital. And there's a chapter in there by Bron Taylor, who argues carefully and thoughtfully that given the great moral urgency of our situation, we need an ecological resistance movement that contemplates and carefully deploys extra legal tactics. We're also going to need resilience in governance. And Brian Martin has a chapter in which he discusses what kind of resilience or how you get resilience in governance. And it means being flexible, not rigid. And that in turn means broad participation, robust debate, and mutual respect. And I'm sure I don't need to tell you that those are qualities that are in pretty short supply right now in our political system. Um, David Orr agrees with that formulation. He thinks that the failure to confront climate change is the greatest political and moral failure in history. He calls it a crime across generations and argues that uh, in order to secure any chance of a decent outcome from this rough patch we're in will require a second democratic revolution. It, governance is also going to bear on issues of things like um, the kinds of responses we try to mount, some of which uh, people will be tempted to try geoengineering schemes. Uh, Simon Nicholson, who will be here this afternoon, thinks that there will be huge pressure to deploy these geoengineering schemes when we finally recognize that 
things like climate change have gone too far and we're really in trouble. Uh, and he believes that research should continue on that, but he also warns that such schemes are technically not proven and would probably have unintended effects and actually carry major geopolitical risks too. Um, and that's an angle that I had not heard discussed very, very extensively, and I commend your attention to it. So what happens if, if we don't manage actually to do any of these things ahead of time? Well, one of the chapters uh, that, that comes toward the end of the third section is, is about Cuba and Cuba's experience in 1990 when the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, they managed to pick up the pieces, even though, uh, as Pat Murphy and Faith Morgan write in that chapter, Cuba's GDP dropped 35 percent, food imports plunged 80 percent, the per capita caloric intake plunged by a thousand calories a day, and the average adult lost about 10 pounds. There were rolling blackouts, the economy pretty much almost unraveled. It was, it was really a nightmare, and it came abruptly. You know, they had to switch from uh, uh, fossil fuel driven agriculture, running tractors and so on, to uh, basically horse and oxen drawn plows, and you can't do that overnight because you don't have the horses and the oxen. So they had to, you know, you can't just breed up a, um, a stock of those an uh, draft animals. So it was quite an uphill struggle. But after a really difficult period with a combination of bottom-up and top-down initiatives, the Cubans managed to salvage a culture with a small environmental footprint and remarkably high levels of non-material well-being. They don't have a consumer culture in Cuba, but Cuban life expectancy is about the same as in the United States, something like seven-tenths of a year uh, uh, lower, and infant mortality is actually lower in Cuba. So is it too late? Well, I'm going to leave that to Stan Robinson. Uh, he wrote the concluding chapter on just that topic. Uh, thank you, Tom. And this question, though, is it too late, is really uh, the wrong question and a bad question. Um, first, because both answers lead to inaction. If you say, is it too late, and the answer is, no, it's not too late, then the response is, I don't have to do anything. If you say, is it too late, and the answer is, yes, it's too late, then the response is, well, there's nothing I can do. So either way, you don't do anything. And not only that, there's never uh, a point at which you get to decide because there's never a decision point where is it too late uh, where you make that decision because history continues to go on. So um, it, it, because as a science fiction writer I get asked that question a lot, is it too late for humanity and for the climate change situation, I've decided, um, at least I had decided, uh, never to uh, answer it as such but to change the question itself. Um, there are going to be losses in the 21st century. This uh, topic we're discussing, uh, survivability on the planet for human civilization, is really the historical question of the 21st century and maybe beyond that. So it's a long emergency. And there are going to be losses because of the situation that we're in right now, as has been discussed uh, previously. So then the, the proper question is not, you know, is it too late, as if we're uh, going to fly off a cliff, but uh, how big are the losses going to be? And because that's somewhat of a negative formulation, I've tried to flip that question into um, uh, putting it like this. How much are we going to save of the current biosphere? So how much are we going to save? And this becomes the question of the project, uh, saving as much as we can. Um, and since life is robust on the planet, life on the planet is going to be fine. It may turn into jungle life. There may be a mass extinction event. And then, you know, some millions of years later, the, there will be re-speciation and um, life on Earth will be fine. Human civilization, however, in such a mass extinction event could be in um, really badly hammered. So um, what we want to avoid is extinctions. This is one of the, I think, rubrics is avoidance of extinctions will mean that uh, over the long haul of restoration in the restoration centuries, we can get back to a... Um, a, a robust and healthy biosphere to hand on to our descendants. So um, avoiding extinctions is really the, uh, one of the main points of the whole project and then after that a long period of restoration. So I guess my contribution uh, to the discussion um, uh, today could be a, a finish with a short commentary on, on what a strange a shape to the future that we have in our minds now because of this situation. It's a, 
the, sh the, the future is kind of like a, a weather forecast or a, some kind of a modeling scenario where we've got the present moment, which we feel we know sort of, and then it goes off in an in in increasingly broad band between uh, dystopia and utopia. And we're aware that we're in a moment of extremely high danger. So that really the possibilities for disaster and dystopia are present and um, uh, imaginable. But we are also uh, extremely powerful technological species with a fairly uh, flexible and adaptable culture. Cultural changes have happened rapidly in the past uh, several times so that historically we can say that we, uh, we change pretty quickly when we see the, um, see the need. So that this shape of the future is um, a present danger with a, a pretty um, easily imaginable disaster. And then also that the possibility of what you could call utopia or a positive future. And it's no longer possible to imagine just muddling forward in an ordinary way and getting to somewhere in between the two. So there's a missing middle in our imagination of the future. And what we've got is the high danger of disaster and the um, perfectly possible uh, possibility of a, of a very positive future of a sustainable human civilization of nine or 10 billion people on this planet, all of them equally healthy, and also the fellow mammals and the rest of the biosphere all equally healthy. That is actually um, technically and, and in physical terms possible. So we have this strange uh, uh, dual shape um, um, to our imagination of the future. And what we, I think uh, we have to avoid is giving into the idea that because the situation is dangerous, we are therefore doomed. The strand of apocalyptic thinking, of millennial thinking in the American imaginary and really in the world that, okay, it's an extremely dangerous situation, therefore we are doomed. This is a common um, mental exercise that has to do with a judgment of ourselves as a species in a community that says that we're not good with disaster, we're not good with danger, and that we will immediately fall apart into a war of all against all. You see this uh, said all the time in the press, in the kind of fourth estate op-ed philosophy of what are human beings, political philosophy. Well, we're good at, you read this a lot, we're good at quick uh, fight or flight situations, we've evolved to uh, run away from the lion or else shoot it, um, uh, fight or flight, but we're not good at long-term planning. Well, this is actually not right. In evolutionary terms, the only reason that we are dominating the globe is because we're good at cooperation and we're good at long-term planning. Both of those things were necessary to take over the globe and have been exercised throughout our evolutionary history and we have a big portion of our brain that's good at it. So in the current situation, we do have uh, politics. We have uh, thinking of the future, you just have to think about insurance, mortgages, contracts, the rule of law, wills, and hedge funds. These are all long-term planning situations. And so we have both the cognitive ability and the legal tools to do long-term planning. It is not a case of a dangerous situation that we are um, mentally unequipped or socially unequipped to handle. We even have currently the economic tools because if you think of the carbon, if we were to put, not a tax on carbon, but if we were to pay the true costs for carbon and just uh, uh, distribute those costs across the society, then the market economy that we already have established is adequate to make a rapid swapping out from a high carbon burn power system to a low carbon burn power system, merely by charging the true costs of the carbon burn itself for the future generation. So you can use economic terms like predatory dumping. If you charge less than it costs to make something in order to drive your competition out of business, predatory dumping, the, the World Trade Organization doesn't like it. Well, uh, who are we competing with in this competition that we're driving out of business? Future generations. So, you know, it's easy to kick on one-year-olds because they're not in a good position to defend themselves, but our predatory dumping is, is a moral bad. Then also um, Ponzi schemes. If we are selling the future short so that when they get the, the bill, there's nothing to pay it with, <clears throat> then we're in a multi-generational Ponzi scheme. Hedge funds, you set aside some money to prepare for the bad times that are going to come. So even, in other words, I'm saying you don't have to radically defeat capitalism, you merely have to use the market economy and the rubrics that we already have properly to get us through this transition 
And so it isn't, uh, it isn't the case that we have to have revolution or have to have a, a, a complete change in our systems of governments or in our economics. We just have to recognize the danger and consider that it's going to be a multi-generational project and go ahead and start uh, doing the necessary work. Thank you.